the setting of our reading is, is of Paul wanting to... Um, uh, wanting the Corinthians to, to continue their generosity. And, and in the previous bits, uh, in the previous verses, he said, um, if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, not to say anything about you, it would, we would be ashamed of having been so confident. So what Paul is saying is, we don't want you to be ashamed, we don't want to be ashamed, because we think you're the most generous people we know. And we just want you to be ready so that you've got this gift for our brothers and sisters who are really in need. So that's the setting. It's a setting of um, preparing a people uh, to be once again generous to the poor in other parts uh, of, the, of the Christian world. So we then come to our reading. So as we come to it tonight, I want you to think about this, that God is concerned for your heart. Your heart really matters to God. And, and when God is concerned for your heart, that, that means he's concerned about your motives, about why you do things. Your motives matter to God. And this reading is really uh, trying to help us to, to get to the right motives for giving. But it goes in a journey that some have taken in, I think, a wrong direction. Verse 6 of our reading says, Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Picture here is a farmer sowing seed on his land. If he only sows a few seeds, he'll only have a small crop. And if he sows lots of seeds, he'll have a big crop. It really isn't rocket science. The thing is, there is a branch of the church that believes that if we name it before God and claim it, it will be ours. And the way we can name it and claim it is, well, this is the argument. God loves us. He wants to bless us. So if we give him lots of whatever it might be, he will give us loads more stuff. That's the short version. You give God loads, he'll give you loads back. Whoever sows generously will reap generously. And that's the way the argument goes. And the parts of the church that follow this are encouraged to give generously, usually to particular ministries of the church or particular pastors. And then they'll say, God will bless you with whatever you want, whatever you need. After it, after all, it says, whoever sows generously will reap generously. And the pastor or the minister or the person says, if you sow into this ministry or sow into this church, God will bless you and you can reap in your lives all the blessings that you want. Maybe a car or a house or a job or good health or a great relationship or whatever, whatever, whatever. The problem is with this is that actually the only people that I've really seen who have those material blessings who didn't have them before were the particular pastors who received the gifts from God's gullible people. Because if it was as simple as that, why did the Apostle Paul have to double up as a tent maker to make ends meet so that he had food to eat? You can see that in Acts 18 and Acts 20. In Acts 20, he says, I've not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Why doesn't the Bible tell us about the increasing wealth of the church in the book of Acts? If, if you give to God, he will bless you back with so much more stuff. And why did so many of the disciples get martyred for their faith? That seems really unfair if you're being generous to God. That doesn't seem like a great exchange, does it? The thing is, this passage 
As we read it, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. It's not talking about my blessings. It's not about me receiving all these wonderful material blessings, like new cars, new houses, new jobs, whatever, whatever. Because our reading goes on in verse 8, it says, God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. We are blessed not so that we may squander our wealth on ourselves and a comfortable lifestyle. That word speaks to all of us here tonight. No, we are blessed so that we can be a blessing. So how do you think about the material things that you enjoy? Are you relieved at the end of the month that you have enough money to pay your Spotify subscription or to pay off some of your credit card debt? You see, God is challenging us to think differently about what we have. You see, God wants to bless us so that we can be a blessing. God wants to bless us so that we can be a blessing. Paul says that we will have all that we need, not all that we want. What are our needs? Basic food and clothing, aren't they? 2 Timothy chapter 6, Paul says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. Being voracious for stuff is absolutely contrary to the cause of the gospel, and it destroys our hearts. It goes on in 2 Timothy 6, We brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. Those who want to get rich, Paul says, fall in temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. And that does not matter who they are. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Paul clearly does not believe what some people have taught about taught in the past, that if you are generous to a particular ministry, you will be blessed with lots of material and other possessions. That's not what God is saying. It's not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, God is no one's debtor and will provide for our needs. And I have to say to you that I learned as quite a young Christian the value of being generous to God as far as I was able. And I have seen God provide for my needs throughout my life. God is just very gracious at providing our needs. Sonia and I, when we were um, first married, we, both, we had two jobs. Sonia was a teacher, I was an engineer. And um, we had two very nice salaries. Thank you very much. It was great. And then uh, our first child came along, Peter, and we went down to one salary, and we were great, thanks very much. And then we went to theological college, and we lived on a grant. And you know what? God provided for all our needs, thank you very much. And, and our experience has been throughout our lives that God is just so gracious. He provides for our needs. He doesn't always provide our wants. And that's the thing. That's the thing. You see, the provision that God is talking about is so that we can be a blessing. If you look in the early books, uh, in the early chapters of the book of Acts, you know you've got the new church, thousands of new Christians in Acts chapter two and Acts chapter four. What marked out this new community, this people, this community of people that follow Jesus, that love Jesus? What you find is that no one among them had any need, because they would sell their possessions and give to one another, so that no one went hungry. And in Acts 6, we see that the church's reputation was so good, they were so good at serving the needs, that the apostles were getting distracted from preaching the gospel to make sure that everyone had enough to eat. So they had to appoint um, some stewards so that the poor, the weak, the vulnerable, the widows and orphans had their proper share, what they needed. The Grace Trust lunch that we do, eat, host here each Saturday, we don't do it, Grace Trust does, but we host it. 
that resumed a month ago, which is just brilliant. And it provides for those who have maybe less than many of us in our community. And we just see God providing. You see, God wants us to be a generous people. So if we receive any blessings, it's so that we can be a blessing. Paul is trying to steer these Christians in Corinth to be generous so that they can see the fruit of the blessings for others. You see, when we bless others, when we're generous to others, it does them good. And by the way, we get blessed in the backwash. It does us good when we see that we're doing the right thing and honouring God. So what is Paul saying to us? He is not saying, give so that you can acquire more. You see, that corrupts our hearts, that corrupts our motives. What he is simply saying, give because it's the right thing to do. Further, be generous. Because it seems to be a law in the world that God has made that if you are generous, you will find God will provide your needs. I, I remember a story from theological college. I've told it before, not from college, from um, university. One of our uh, lead, Christian leaders at uni was telling us a story of, of some friends of theirs who decided to try and outgive God. And, and you know that Christians are, well, they, they're, they're supposed, they think they're supposed to tithe to give 10% of their income to God. So this family uh, were giving 10% of their God. So they decided to give 20% of their salary to God, of their family income. And then they decided to give 30%, and then 40%, and then 50%. And they were giving away more than was their monthly budget as a family because they felt God was asking them to do that. But they found that God provided for their needs. You see, you can't outgive God. You can't outgive God. But God does ask us to be generous. And of course, being generous is important because it blesses others. We know as Christians that loving our neighbours is such an important part of what it is to be a Christ follower. Remember Jesus said, was asked what's the greatest commandment? He said it's to love God with all that you are and to love your neighbour as yourselves. So any blessings we received are so that we can bless our neighbours. So that's the first thing. Blessed to be a blessing. Verse 7 says, Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So whatever you sow for the kingdom, out of your resources that God has blessed you with so freely, not because anyone is forcing you to, or because you really don't want to, hey, we've all been there, but God loves a cheerful giver. Do it cheerfully, with joy. That word for cheerful is the word, Greek word hilarion, from which we get the word hilarious. You see, God loves a hilarious giver. A sort of Tommy Cooper. No, no. Uh, but God loves a hilarious giver. He loves it when I'm giving to others, when we give to others. Because it makes us smile if we are those cheerful givers. Now, I could talk about the tithing I've just mentioned and of the importance of being generous to God. The danger is I can slip into a, a false position the bless me reason for giving. That, that there's a sort of rule that if I give 10%, then I'll be blessed or whatever. That's not the Christian position. Paul here is not saying that giving is unimportant. Indeed, it is very important. It's a sign of our commitment, uh, to, a commitment to and love for God. Our giving to God is really important. But we need to do it freely and cheerfully rather than because we're under this sense of law you see we're no longer under law Jesus has set us free from the law but if you read the Old Testament you see that the people of God in the Old Testament by law 
had to tithe. They had to give a tenth of their income, and there were other free will and uh, other harvest offerings that came through the year. So, so that actually, if you look at the Old Testament law, the people of God gave a lot more than 10% to God. That was the law. That was the rules. If you're God's people, you do this. Yes, it's a response to God's loving you and being his people, but these are the rules if you're going to be God's people. The thing is, Jesus comes along, and on the cross, he breaks the power of sin and the law. We're no longer under the law. We're set free. It means that when we get it wrong, we don't have to go through all sorts of legal hurdles to be forgiven. We don't have to have sacrifices and all the other things that are there in the law for when we sin. Because Jesus has paid for it all on the cross. He has put us right with God forever. And we are so blessed with that. It means that the Old Testament law no longer has to be fulfilled because Jesus has completed it on the cross. So all the sacrifices that we ever needed for all that we've ever done wrong are all done at the cross. All the rules we have ever to be done can be left behind because of what Jesus has done on the cross. The thing is, when Jesus is on the cross, he's dying for us, when he rises again, that act of love, doesn't that inspire a response of love? If someone loves us so much that they're prepared to die for us, doesn't it make sense that we respond to them with our love? If the people of God had the law with certain rules they had to keep so that they could keep, keep okay with God, if, if they had to give 10%, let's say, well, we've got Jesus who sorted it all out. I, I think we probably might want to say, 10% is nowhere near enough. In which case, you know, we're not talking about rules. And that's why Paul talks about God loving a cheerful giver. Because it's about from our hearts. It's about our motives. It's not feeling condemned because we only do this or only do that. And I'm really not trying to make us feel guilty because we're only tithing or whatever we do. But what I want us to challenge it, what I want to, to challenge us is to think about our giving. You see, the challenge is to be cheerful about it and happy about it. And and if you are a multimillionaire and a Christian and you turn up at church on Sunday and put 50p in the offering, apart from the fact you wouldn't notice it. Well, it asks all sorts of questions about your heart, doesn't it? That you don't think God is worth much more than that. It's a real challenge, and, and there aren't hard and fast rules. And Jesus tells the story of, of the widow who put in two copper coins in the offering at the temple when he was there, and, and you know, he said, and rich people were putting in sheds, shed loads of money and doing it very openly. And she humbly put in two copper coins, which was next to nothing in value. And she said, he, Jesus said she put in more than all the others because she put in all she had to live on. And, and what we're trying to say, what I'm trying to say is that the amount is completely irrelevant, actually. The amount that you give to God really isn't important. What's important is what your heart is doing. Because God wants you to give cheerfully, happily, because you're so grateful for what Jesus has done for you. And that's the point. It's not a rule or a regulation. It's simply something that comes out of a heart that has discovered what Christ has done and just wants to thank God. And that is for something that, for each of us to work out with the Lord. So when you give to the Lord, do you smile? I just want to encourage you to smile. However much, whatever. Don't worry about proportion. Do you smile? Because it should be a joyful thing when it flows from faith rather than because the Lord says you've got to give 
this or that. Finally, in the last few verses of our reading, it says, Now he supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. He who does that will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us, that's Paul saying so, through Paul and his uh, friends, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God because what they give will go to other places that are in famine. The service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. So our generosity results us in being enriched, but also in, enables others to overflow in generosity to God. Generosity is something that blesses others, and they respond in thanks to God. Just yesterday... Um, I had an email from a pastor friend to say that their church uh, was being given their church building uh, and the pastor's house by a trust. It's something a number of us have been praying about. And it's a complete change. And it is a wonderful blessing. And I can't tell you who it is yet because there are some legal hoops that have to be sorted out. But it is extraordinary and wonderful, uh, wonderfully generous and overflowing in thanks to God. I know that fellowship are so thankful to God, but it is required somebody, the existing trustees, to be very generous. If we needed another motive to give generously to God and to others, we see it here that when we bless others with our generosity, it overflows in many expressions of thanks to God. So when you listen to God, to God and do what he asks of you in this area, that is being a generous and cheerful giver, God is blessed and worship, and our actions enable others to worship him with their thanksgiving. So here we are at our annual Harvest Festival, giving thanks to God. And we have all these material gifts that we are, have been blessed with today that people have generously brought. But they're, they're symbols of the blessings that we've received from the Lord. We are so blessed and rightly are able to be generous to God and indeed to the various agencies that will receive these gifts as well as the financial offering. The Apostle Paul here in our reading challenges us to be generous not because of the law, not because we have to, but because it blesses others. It blesses us and glorifies God, who is thanked and praised. Let me pray. Father God, we thank you for all that you've blessed us with, whether it is much or little. We are simply thankful for your generosity to us in your material provision in our lives. Thank you, Lord. And our prayer is a simple one, Lord, that you'd please help us to be a cheerful giver to the glory of your name. Amen.